Hello, and welcome to Setting the Standard, the podcast about wireless radio standards creation from the Wireless Innovation Forum. I'm your host and communications director of the forum, Stephanie Hamill. Today, we have a special episode outlining day two of the forum's virtual summit, WinCom 2021, featuring a keynote by Martha Suarez of the Dynamic Spectrum Alliance, forum project updates with President John Glossner, and sessions on six gigahertz commercialization and protection of passive services and radio spectrum. I'm here with Ken Dingman of L3 Harris and co-chair of the Forum's Software Defined Systems Committee. Um, and we're going to be talking about Ken's sessions on um, SDR standards one and two on Wednesday and Thursday at 6 a.m. Pacific, 9 a.m. Eastern. Hi, Ken. Hi, Stephanie. How are you doing? All right. How are you? I'm doing good. Good. All right. So can you give me a background of these two partner sessions that are occurring on these two days and uh, what you'll be going over and we'll be talking? Sure. So these sessions are going to really be covering some of the activities that we have going on uh, within the Software Defined Systems Committee uh, within the forum. And the first session is going to focus on our our relationship and the work that we're doing with SOSA. Um, A few years ago, um, a little while ago, the forum signed an agreement to collaborate with SOSA and for us to provide inputs to that that, um, activity that's happening. And this is a kind of a unique opportunity. Um, If people aren't familiar with SOSA, it's a very large um, activity that's happening within the U.S. government. Um, but as such, because it's within the U.S. government, it's only open to uh, U.S. organizations and U- U.S. companies. Um, so having the forum um, being able to collaborate and work with SOSA is a great opportunity for our international organizations uh, to provide um, inputs to SOSA and help frame the um, architecture that SOSA is putting together. So up to this point, the work within SOSA has been focused on sensors, radars, um, other kinds of electronic systems, but really not communication solutions. And so this is where we are going to draw on our our committee's deep understanding of radio communications to help develop that solution and provide that expertise to SOSA so that their framework and their platform has a a, a rich and and deep um, implementation for a communication system. So this session will uh, talk about the background that's led up to the collaboration between SOSA and the Wireless Innovation Forum. Uh, We're gonna provide a summary of the activities and accomplishments that we have had to date. And we're gonna highlight the approach um, of integrating SOSA with radio communication systems, uh, in particular those that have been used, um, used the SCA and implemented the SCA and how we could um, have a SOSA and SCA compatibility and and how is that being developed within the project. So that's gonna be the first session, that's gonna be Wednesday morning. Um, After that, we're going to move into sessions that are focused on um, specifications that have been developed um, within the Wireless Innovation Forum within the SDS committee. And the two two specifications that we're gonna talk about are the transceiver and the time service facilities. Um, But before we get into those specifications, we'll spend a little bit of time talking about the idea, the concept of what is a facility and what that provides. Um, within, the, within our committee, uh, when we develop a, a new standard specification, we, we base it on this facility concept. And so we'll go over the idea of the facilities, the um, basic capabilities and expectations of what they provide and the structure of them, such as the architectural concepts that come with the facilities, uh, their service-oriented support, and the facilities and the attributes that should be provided by a facility. And we'll also discuss the object object model, um, object model driven architecture, which supports concepts such as PIM, which is a platform independent model, and PISM, which are platform specific models of the PIM. And so each of the specifications, all the specifications that we develop within the SDS now follow this facilities concept. So it's so it's good to have an underlying understanding of the facilities approach as you're trying to um, work with and use the transceiver and time service facilities. Mm -hmm. And so then on Thursday, what we will do is we'll go into a much more in-depth discussion about what the transceiver and time service facilities provide. Um, They're both very similar in terms of structure and content. Um, Both of these were developed by the Wind Forum within the past couple of years and have had a lot of international collaboration in their development. So they um, have points of view from Europe and from the US and from other parts of the globe. So they're, they're well-rounded specifications. 
And as I mentioned, they both follow the facilities approach. Um, so they have a PIM specification and a number of PISM uh, specifications. Um, for both of those right now, we have a C++ and an SCA and FPGA uh, PISMs. And so we'll talk about the PIM more so than the PISMs and go over the PIM at a, at a little more in-depth discussion. And so, you know, the concepts that we're going to talk about um, during this presentation are going to be really the basis of the capability, such as bursts and timing and distribution of the functions onto the different processing nodes. We'll look into the specific interfaces that are used to define those concepts, especially at the, at the PIM level, and the service groups that are used to organize them. So to give you a good overview of the structure of those specifications and the content and capabilities that are provided by those specifications. So that'll be Wednesday and Thursday, um, really covering our active projects and, and um, the things that we're developing and providing um, to, the, to the market. Yeah, it's been a really busy year for your committee and producing these documents, so it'll be nice to go over them. Um, and who do you feel would get the most out of this session? Who should be there? Yeah, so these sessions are, I would say, targeted more at your implementation, your, your developers, your engineers. Um, the SOSA one um, in particular, it's going to be more of a, a framework and an architecture discussion. Um, and we're still working on that architectural level. So this is more for your systems engineers, your system architects, um, who really have the big picture understanding of, of what the object models um, across the, the different standards are, you know, SOSA utilizes models or specifications such as FACE and CMOS and, you know, understanding of those and, and how the SCA will fit in alongside of those. So people that have that background um, would be the target audience for these. Um, with the other three, the transceiver, the time service and the facilities, that would really be for your embedded developers. Anybody who is developing an application um, that needs the capabilities provided by the transceiver, or by a transceiver, or by a time service. Uh, those would be the audience that we're targeting uh, with the following sessions. Great. Well, I look forward to them. It'll be two very information-packed mornings on uh, November 1st and 2nd. Okay. Thanks very much, Ken, and I will talk to you again soon. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Today I'm here with Mark Gibson of Comscope and Vice President and Vice Chair of the Forum. Thanks for joining me, Mark. Pleasure, Steph. Thanks for having me. All right. Today we're going to talk about your six gig uh, commercialization session, which is Wednesday, the 1st of December at 9.15 a.m. Pacific, 12.15 uh, p.m. Eastern. Um, so can you give me an overview of this session? Yes, I can. Uh, so um, this panel is going to sort of try to focus more on why are people so interested in the six gig band for uh, unlicensed use? Um, if, you know, if anybody that's been following telecom, um, you know, over the last, what, three or four years should know that the band was just made available last year by the commission um, for use for two types of devices for unlicensed use. One is standard power uh, that can operate up to four watts and the other is low power that can operate up to a watt. And so the forum has been focused on um, or has been directing work on developing standards around the and, and again for it to be able to use the, pa the, the spectrum up to four watts. Um, you need this uh, new thing called an automatic frequency or automated frequency coordination system, uh, an AFC, which is very similar to the spectrum access system in this in the CBRS band. So the wind forum has been working on developing standards around this. Uh, how the AFC would operate. So we thought it would be helpful to uh, bring in people who have an interest in the band um, to give some sense as to why they want to use the 6 gigahertz band. What do they see as the um, opportunities that 6 gig presents? Um, what do they see as some of the potential hurdles uh, beyond perhaps the AFC? So we're really looking at trying to get people involved from all the, all the areas of unlicensed, not just Wi-Fi, but Wi-Fi, in general, uh, the 3GPP people that might want to be using it for NRU, new radio, unlicensed, 
the ultra wideband people who might want to use it for that and anybody else that we can think of who might have some interest there. So um, in, in, the, in the license band, which, you know, as you probably know, is the uh, 5925 to 7125 meg band. So it's 1200 megahertz made available for unlicensed. So we're not we're going to try to deal more in this session with why is this band um, uh, of so much interest for unlicensed use rather than get into some of the more controversial aspects of, you know, what does unlicensed mean with the current incumbents? Um, that's been sort of well hashed out um, and probably no, you know, there's no um, uh, single reason for that. So we want to try to look at the uh, and wh why people are really interested in the band and maybe some thoughts on how they would plan to use it. So that's the main reason for the session. Okay, and your presenters, you're also going to have a panel with these folks too? We are. We're, hopeful, we're hoping to have um, uh, interest from the corners, again, of this area that we uh, know are going to use it. Certainly Wi-Fi, um, hopefully uh, ultra-wideband, hopefully some representation from the 3GPP people and other unlicensed areas as we can find them. Those are the three main areas that have expressed interest. Uh, so we're hopeful to get um, uh, panelists from uh, those areas. Yeah, hopefully we'll have some announcements soon there. Yep, we um, should have announcements this week. Great, perfect. Mm -hmm. And I'll put them out there. Um, who who do you think should, should come to this session? Uh, people should come to this session if they're interested in learning more about why is the six gig band so much of, of, of so much interest to the unlicensed community. Um, we know a lot of we know a lot about why the current incumbent community has issues with it, um, which may be the subject of another panel later on. But this is more about trying to provide a little more context for why is this so much interest. So people should come to this, you know, if they want to know why does Wi-Fi want it, why does unlike uh, ultra wideband want it, why do others want it, how they're going to put it to use, what are maybe the time frames, um, and you know what's all the fuss about. Right, that's what we should name it. <laughs> I've, actually, I've, had, <laughs> yeah, I've actually had some presentations around six gigahertz. What's all the fuss about? So. <laughs> oh, that's great. All right. Well, so we will hear what the fuss is about in just a few weeks. Um, yeah. Thanks so much, Mark, for putting the session together and for joining me today. It's a pleasure. Thanks a lot, Steph. Great questions. All right. Talk to you later. Mm -hmm. Hey, hi, I'm here with Andy Clegg of Google and Kevin Gifford of CU Boulder, who are presenting the protection of passive services in radio spectrum session on Wednesday, the 1st of December at 11 a.m. Pacific time, 2 p.m. Eastern. Hi, Andy and Kevin. Thanks for joining me today. Hey, Stephanie. Hello, Steph. Uh, okay, so first of all, can we get some background on why you all wanted this session to be part of WinCom and why do you think it's important to the wireless community? Uh, sure, I'll go ahead and start off. Um, so certainly radio astronomy um, has a problem with too much radio frequency interference, which comes from wireless communications, such as WinForum. Um, really, wireless communications and radio astronomy are both important and crucial to the United States national infrastructure and science. And so our goal was to look at how to share the spectrum so that radio astronomies could have better observations, make better science, and potentially there could be a payback in that the spectrum sharing could allow radio astronomy to have uh, incentives to share and provide, let's say, bi-directional sharing so radio astronomy could get some, um, uh, I don't know what I want to say here, Steph. I guess just return on um, its spectrum allocations and that they potentially can make um, financial remuneration from sharing the spectrum with commercial providers. Andy, you want to clarify that for me, please? Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I think, you know, the whole concept of bidirectional sharing or, you know, two services could benefit for, off of each other, you know, one sharing their spectrum with the other. And I think this applies to passive services as well. This typically hasn't been tried for passive services, but I, I you know, I think it's a uh, a good thing to look forward to, uh, especially now that you know there's no greenfield spectrum. There's a lot more spectrum sharing that has to happen in order to allow access. Um, <clears throat> and by the way, I think you know WinForum and WinCom are good places to discuss this because. Um, we have the broad wireless community that participates and we're also all about innovation. It is the wireless innovation forum. And, uh, and so the innovation space here involves, you know, how can we improve protection of passive services while also increasing spectrum sharing? Uh, 
So I think uh, Woodform and Wincom are, are great venues to address this. Great. And so what are some of the topics you'll be covering? You mentioned uh, some a little bit, but are you going to be talking about your um, committee work at all? Yes, I'll start off with this and then the Andy um, clarify as usual. You know, really for radio astronomy sites, which are here terrestrially, right? We all know about radio astronomy sites like Green Bank and others that are across the United States. They've got two primary problems. They can get radio frequency interference from terrestrial generated systems, say cell systems or Wi-Fi. And so if that interference uh, occurs while they are taking observations that can compromise their observations. The other interference source is from overhead satellites that can come across and are transmitting down to ground stations, and that causes interference for radio astronomies as well. So those are two of the primary topics that we want to address. We want to detect terrestrial interference, RFI hunting, and uh, locate those rogue emitters and make them uh, stand down or go away. And then for satellites, you know, the one thing about satellites is once they're up there, you know where they're at. So we can understand when satellites are coming overhead of a particular specific radio astronomy geolocation, and then we can adjust the RA observational schedule so that they have no interference. So ground-based emitters, space-based emitters that are causing problems with RA observations, we want to coordinate that so that radio astronomy will have cleaner scientific observations. Yeah, and, um, uh, you know, uh, this, this is... Uh, uh, Again, one of the topics that's good for WinForum because um, in WinForum, we developed a lot of the standards that led to the spectrum access systems operating in CBRS. And we're also working currently on standards that will lead to how we deploy automated frequency coordination systems in six gigahertz. And one of the areas that we're discussing in the committee is um, how could we extend and apply the protection methods we use in SAS and AFC to protecting passive services in, in other bands. And so you've got the collection of experts that developed the SAS protection methodology and are currently developing the AFC protection methodology. Let's apply that to passive services. Uh, and that's one of the issues we're going to um, address in the, in the session. So who do you think um, this session applies to or who should really be there? Um, well, I'll start with that. I think uh, the radio astronomy community in general who have been coalescing around this idea of a national radio dynamic zone, um, such as what Andy and I are doing at Hack Creek Radio Observatory in Northern California. So the radio astronomy people are quite um, uh, a great audience and I think um, as they learn about the activities that really we want to help them improve their observations and we may give them the capability to bi-directionally share the spectrum that they have with commercial providers for financial incentives, RA is certainly, you know, a number one entity. But then the people that do the spectrum sharing, right, whether it's CBRS three-tier style sharing or AFC sharing, the members of WinForum, and then just, you know, the general uh, I'll say um, uh, wireless communications um, constituencies, whether it's Wi-Fi or whether it's cellular, those are elements that are, you know, really thought to be, um, you know, almost a human right in that people want to have mobile access to wireless communications. So these vendors have a role to play. You know, there's a balance between providing this unfettered access and being able to protect radio astronomy. So those are three really big communities, right? The RA scientific community, and then the wireless service providers, whether it's cellular, whether it's Wi-Fi, whether it's the DOD, um, all of them should have an interest in improving spectrum sharing. It's a limited resource. It's a critical resource. And between WinForum and this particular project, we're showing how to do innovate uh, and more efficiently share spectrum for the benefit of all the stakeholders. So it's really a wide constituency. I would think that really all the members of WinForum would be interested and then the radio astronomy scientific community um, as well. Andy, who did I miss there? No, I think you got everybody. Um, 
you know, the first few meetings of our committee have been basically sharing information among those communities. So the active community uh, doesn't really have a, a good understanding of how passive services operate. And the passive services, um, while they follow, um, you know, active uh, commercial service developments in the spectrum, um, they're not intimately familiar with how the active services um, operate. And, um, you know, the, the good thing about this committee is it's been a venue to bring those two communities together and learn. And in fact, you know, like I said, our first few meetings have been a tremendous set of uh, presentations from standouts in the passive uh, services and scientific services community trying to educate the WinForum membership on how passive services work. And we've also had some presentations on how we're doing spectrum sharing among active services and how that could potentially be applied to passive services. And so the passive services community has benefited. So this session at Wincom, same thing. I think, uh, you know, these two communities can learn a tremendous amount uh, of good information from each other. Great. Well, I look forward to it. And um, thanks for putting on the session and joining me. Thank you, Stephanie. Andy and I are very much looking forward to it as well. Thank you. See you all December 1.